Hi, and welcome to the show. Subscribe at kevinmd.com slash podcast. Get CME for this episode by clicking on the CME link in the show notes. Today, we welcome Francisco Torres and Felix Lenetsky. Francisco has been on the show many times. He's an interventional physiatrist. Felix is a pain management physician, and together they wrote the Kevin MD article, Finding Hope and Relief, A Physical Therapist's Journey with Chronic Pain and Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Felix and Francisco, welcome to the show. Thank you, Kevin, for having us. So I'm just going to ask each of you to briefly share your story and journey to where you are today. Francisco, why don't you go first? Yes, thank you, Kevin. I am an interventional physiatrist. I have been in the area of Clearwater, Florida for the last 30 years. Basically, my clinic is musculoskeletal. That's what I did my fellowship. So I deal a lot with pain management and do interventional. And my colleague here, Dr. Felix Lineski, I met him many, many years ago at a meeting. He's, as a matter of fact, a professor. And his expertise is more with collagen tissue disorder. That's the main thing he does is regenerative injection therapy. And that's our connection when we have cases that are complicated with pain management. And he does different approaches, which is, is like a cutting edge in, in terms of the treatment that we can help with the patients. And uh, Francisco, how common is it that you see ehlers danlos syndrome patients in your clinic? So it, it's a matter, it's very interesting. That's why I, I decided, we decided to write the article is because I thought it was not that common. I thought that it, it really was something that maybe two, 5% of the population. But I start, the, the more patients I start seeing, particularly younger patients, athletic, that were involved in car accidents or injury that develop this chronic pain. And people were saying, well, what's wrong with them? And they're very flexible. They're very, they look athletic. And I said, that's what I recommend to do stretching. And these people are complaining of pain. And so it made me start looking into it. And, and, that, and that's where the article came from, because I remember meeting this physical therapist, well-known in the community. And she told me the story that she went to physical therapy because she found a lot of pain in the family and a lot of chronic injuries and back pain and decided to see whether the physical therapy could help. But then she became frustrated with the fact that she was not helping that much. And then she developed symptoms very similar to her family. And to tell you the whole story in a short a paragraph, it's just that she decided to get tested. And after seeing so many specialists, finally, they came up with a diagnosis of ehlers danlos syndrome. And after that, there was a lot of frustration until she came to my clinic and we talk about, and then I, I remember Dr. Lineski treating hypermobility syndrome many times. So I decided to refer her to, to him. And I'm telling you, it, she was very happy. And to this day, 20 years later, she's still very functional and very active in the community. All right. And we'll go more into that case in a little bit. But Felix, just briefly share your story and journey to where you are today. Well, my story is very simple. Uh, I was at the edge with my neck pain and I had post-traumatic cervical instability. So I went to a colleague who treated me. At that time, it was called sclerotherapy, and I immediately became better. I became better, but three days later, the pain returned. So I came to him and said, please inject me again. He said, but the book says only once in four to three weeks. Well, I flew a long time to see you, so please do it again. And he did it. And it lasted me for half a year. Then I continued the treatment with the other physicians. And then I started practicing this methodology. At the beginning, it was called the sclerotherapy. Then was prolotherapy. And then I gave it a name more appropriate. is regenerative injection therapy, which encompasses all of the common new biologic injections as well as old chemical injections. And this is what I am practicing. All right. And just to give some context before we go more into your story specific with Erlis Dano. So regenerative injection therapy, what typical conditions, Felix, can you use this for? You basically treat people with the joint hypermobility and instability and pain arising from those conditions. This includes cervical facet syndromes, whiplash injuries, cervical rib syndrome, neck shoulder syndrome, shoulder neck syndrome, and vice versa, low back pain. But the beginning of this whole issue goes back to 1937 when Dr. Schultz was first treated hypermobility and instability of TMJs. Almost 
but in two months, Dr. Gedney published an article where he was treating unstable knees and sacroiliac joints with this methodology. Of course, it was very, very aggressive treatments at that time. Those medications are no longer available. So currently we are using more available things like dextrose. Hyperosmolar dextrose mixed with lidocaine creates a reproduction of new collagen fibers. And this what creates the stability of all the joints that have ligaments around them. It also addresses the fascia, superficial and deep fascial issues, which is also collagenous tissue. All right, Francisco, you and Felix wrote the Kevin MD article. You talked a little bit about that case earlier, finding hope and relief, a physical therapist's journey with chronic pain and Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. So, Francisco, tell us more about this case and story. Well, it represents many times. I think the, the average amount of, especially that a patient sees before being diagnosed finally with the diagnosis is at least 20 specialists. And then those 20 specialists, each one is gonna recommend some treatment. And I think that was the frustration that you're treating a condition that affects particularly the connective tissue, the ligaments with modalities like bracing, like exercises. Some people even go with injection of steroids. And as a matter of fact, I saw several patients being treated with ablations, which we know is not gonna touch at all the collagen tissue. And then I think that more we, are aware that we can identify this, this condition, then we can offer the right treatment and uh, eliminate all this pain and suffering that they get frustrated sometimes, you know, because the, the, the issue with Eller Danlos is like a, there are 13 varieties and the only one that we have not identified the gene is the most common one, the hypermobile type three. And that's the one that we normally see in the clinic. So it, it's just that I think we need to be aware that there, there's a possibility on a, on a healthy patient that after a whiplash injury or an injury that start having pain and it doesn't respond to any of the conventional treatments before we say there's nothing we can do is that there is a possibility of the regenerative injection therapy. Current literature actually suggests that hypermobile joint syndrome or joint hypermobility syndromes are the same as hypermobile endless downless syndrome because they don't have genetic marker. So this particular treatment going back to 1930s uh, was quite often employed by many physicians, but uh, subsequently with the development of steroid injections, it was forgotten. However, there's still, a, I would say, about a thousand physicians around the United States employing these modalities. Felix, take us into your clinic. What right. is the typical presentation of an Ehlers Danlos syndrome patient that would be appropriate for regenerative injection therapy? The typical patient comes in with the neck, upper back, or thoracic, lower back and hip or shoulder issues. So obviously in the first visit, you cannot address all of the above areas. So I usually divide it in half. Either I will do the upper quarter, such as neck, thoracic area, or the lower back, depending on which symptoms is of pain is predominant and palpatory which areas are more tender. Like there is an example of a recent lady who came in after three years under the orthopedic group. She had three sessions of cervical facet denervation with radio frequency, didn't work. The surgeon who was treating her retired and suggested she goes to a pain management specialist. Apparently the guy listened to one of my lectures and said, no, 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 you're not my patient. Go to Linetsky, he will deal with it. So she came in and in the first treatment session, I asked her how the neck versus the lower back, the lower back was worse. So at this particular session, I injected the interspinous ligaments 
and this is, includes the superficial skin fascia that is attached to the interspinous ligament. I injected posterior sacroiliac ligaments. I injected the lateral aspect of the iliac crest. I injected the greater trochanteric area, and I also, with ultrasound guidance, injected the hip joint. Solution, the first time I didn't know how she will react, I only used 12.5% dextrose. Within a month, she came back, and we addressed the cervical area. And at that time, I knew that she was tolerating quite well, so I went all the way to the 25% dextrose with lidocaine, which brings lidocaine to 0.5% in the final injectate. So I injected all the cervical facets showing capsules bilaterally. I injected the iliacostalis thoracis insertions from the second to the fourth rib on the left side, because these were what her predominant symptomatology. And I injected interspinous ligaments and syndesmotic joints from C71 through T45. She tolerated quite well. And then she came the third time within six weeks. And this time she started talking like a storm. Initially, she was very kind of to herself. She started saying how much better she is, how much work she can tolerate on the computer because she is a lawyer working for a local sheriff's office. And she types by herself. She doesn't have an assistant. And this was one of the major tasks with the headaches. Actually, she had cervicogenic headaches with this instability of the cervical facet joints. And obviously, radiofrequency denervation didn't help her. And Francisco, you mentioned that there are a lot of other modalities that you see in various pain management clinics when it comes to Ehlers-Danlos syndrome patients. What type of patients would you typically refer to Felix to consider RIT therapy? So normally anyone who has any type of ligament dysfunction, and that can, doesn't have to be outlet dandelion, it's going to be chronic dislocation of the shoulder. Uh, here in Florida, we see a lot of the, you know, whiplash type of yeah. situation. It doesn't have to be necessarily related to an accident or car. It could be just anything that happens in the health. But one thing that I want to mention is that the patient, the typical patient that have ligament problems, they're normally the one that tells you can check their, there's like a, a way of grading this in terms of the flexibility of the thumb, the, the little finger, and also the elbows, the knees, and the how, how good they can reach down. So we check for that type of a, a hypermobility of the joints. And then when I see that that is associated with pain, then I tend to refer those patients to, to feel it. If the patients have like clicking of the normal joints during normal activity, this is suggestive of the laxity of the capsule and capsular ligaments. And Felix, any potential complications from the procedure? Any patients that you should not consider RIT therapy for? Well, you have to be extremely careful at the upper cervical segments. So therefore, C1, I don't inject in the office. I usually refer to the guys who do C1 under fluoroscopic guidance. However, starting from C2, I inject the lateral aspects, spinous process of C2, very easily palpable. I inject the rectus capitis posterior major insertions to the occipital bone obliquus capitis inferior. I also do some complications, but very rare. The last one I had maybe 15 years ago. When you do the ribs, and specifically attachments of the iliacostalysis, and the patient is rather big, the needle slips and you can have a pneumothorax. But otherwise, and this is self-limited, I never had a pneumothorax. I had about six pneumothoraxes over the 31 years I've been doing it, and all of them were self-limited. Neither one ended up with the chest tube 10 12%. One thing that, Kevin, that I want to remind people is that with LS downs, particularly, these people, these patients have a lot of autonomic dysfunction associated with the condition. So they can have what normally people say a vasovagal or hypo, 
the, the orthostatic hypotension. And I'm very careful. And I talk to Felix sometimes. I, I tell him, look, let's start slow because if they get a basovagal or, or the POTS, then it's a bad experience. So I think that you need to start kind of slow because there's so many injections involved. And, and that will be something to, to keep in mind. We're talking to Francisco Torres and Felix Linetsky. Francisco is an interventional physiatrist. Felix is a pain management physician. Together, they wrote the Kevin MD article, Finding Hope and Relief, a Physical Therapist's Journey with Chronic Pain and Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Now I'm gonna ask each of you just your take home messages that you wanna share with the Kevin MD audience. Felix, I'm gonna start with you. Well, one has to realize that one injection will not do the trick. It has to be multiple injection at the same sessions and all of the areas relevant to the area of pain has to be addressed if they are painful to palpation. The second thing that there is a hope for these people. There is real hope. And unfortunately, it's not well documented in the recent literature. However, there is some literature specifically mentioning dislocations in the hypermobile and less download syndrome came from New Zealand and the guy was using heavy sclerosins like polydocanol and sotradecal. And his, in his series of 80 patients, all of them got better. He's a rheumatologist by the main specialty. And Francisco, tell us some of your take home messages that you want to leave with the Kevin MD audience. I will say that I think that if you identify the condition early, there's hope for these people. And this is a typical patient that go for without the proper care. And I know that we have labeled them that they are, you know, emotionally unstable because this have this disproportionate amount of pain and people who have to happen to look very healthy. So it's just to be aware that there is a condition like that and there is treatment that we can modify the disease. Francisco and Felix, thank you so much for sharing your time and insight. Thanks again for being on the show. Thank you, Gary. Thank I appreciate you. it.